Solange, where are you located? I am in São Paulo, Brazil. Oh, great. That's the city I was born in. I grew up here. And uh, I spent nine years in Europe. Now, now I'm, I'm back here for five years now. Uh -huh. Great. And did you spend all the time in Europe in Zurich or where? No, I spent time in Hamburg. Hamburg. Hamburg in Germany first. Yes. And then in Geneva. And Zurich, it was just for the training. I see, I see. Zurich is three hours from Geneva. Ah, yeah. It, back in the old days, back in the 80s, early 80s, I, I made a lot of trips to Hamburg. I love Hamburg. It's, it's a, a nice beautiful, city. Yes, beautiful, beautiful city. And I always liked uh, the taxi cabs, Tim, <laughs> in Hamburg, our, our yachts or large boats that carry about maybe 100 people or so. And, yeah. and there are all these uh, streets that are actually canals or rivers and uh, these boats and then a huge lake, lake in the middle of Hamburg that where yeah. there's often sailboat racing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a beautiful city. It's cold, but it's beautiful. Yes, it's cold, but it's beautiful. It's very cold. Yeah, and then uh, also I remember going up to Lebec one time from there. And, it's very uh, beautiful as well. Yeah, yeah. Germany is beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful country. Uh, so Isadora did make it. She's here. She's got oh, her. Okay. She's got her mic on uh, mm. mute, and she's not showing her uh, video. <laughs> so, so therefore, she's might not be showing on your screen. But yeah. she's here. She, she's my big supporter. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if your she, children she's get, who, she's the one who read all my proofs, uh, gave a lot of uh, insights, and told me I can't understand it. Uh, you have to change the way you explain because I'm not capable to understand. Very quickly, uh, let me introduce the people that are here uh, mm. that are participating right now, and there may be others that join us as we go. And so what I'm doing is I'm making a recording of this session. Uh, right now I have it on gallery view so we can see everyone, but uh, when you are talking, I'm going to put it on speaker view, so we'll be focusing on you. Right now we have uh, Tim Holmes, who's my partner on this activity. I'm gonna ask him to explain what we're doing here uh, in a moment. Uh, and Tim is a internationally known artist and was the first American artist to have a solo exhibition at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg about 30 years ago, believe it or not. And uh, so he's been an artist all his life. Uh, Miles Flagg, and Tim, by the way, lives in Helena, Montana, which is uh, on the opposite side of the continent from me. Uh, Miles Flagg is in Alberta, uh, Ca uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and Idris Wardock is from is now in Vancouver, and of course Mirtis, you know, uh, is from Paraiba, uh, Brazil, and uh, here's uh, Jocelyn Sang Sanglang is joining us right now. She's uh, she's a retired. A psychiatrist who now lives in Honolulu. Let me ask Tim to explain how this came about, why we we're doing this, and so on. Well, the original idea sp springs out of the fact that that in contemporary culture, we just really don't have any rituals for dealing with loss and grief, and especially with the coronavirus pandemic, which is all over the world, um, everybody is affected and people are not only losing loved ones, but jobs and um, incomes, um, relationships, especially with co-workers and that kind of thing. And everybody, everybody's lives have been upset in some way. Mm -hmm. And we, and yet we have no way of really addressing that in a, 
in a community way. And so we thought this, this would be a great idea for just opening a, a venue for people anywhere to get together and just talk about how it feels and what we're dealing with and, and this sense of loss of community and, and the things, the, the sort of stability factors that we're used to. And I think the, the coronavirus kind of gives us an excuse, but the fact is we all need to have a way of connecting with each other in a, in a deep and meaningful way, not just hanging out at the cafe and talking about the weather and whatnot, but, <clears throat> but really being able to address the things that make us come alive in this, in this world. So that was kind of the impetus of the group. And I've been really kind of amazed that this is such a high quality collection of people. I mean, we haven't got, we haven't got a, a dullard in the whole crowd and, and except for being Zoom bombed a couple of times, uh, we've, we've just had very, very interesting, um, compassionate, concerned people. And for me, it's become a real great lifeline to have a community like this I'm an, I'm an artist and I live alone, I work alone. I've always worked alone. So the, the whole sequestration thing for me has been not that big a deal because that's just life, yeah. normal life. But I do need community. And so this is, for me, it really provides a way of connecting with other people on a meaningful level. So thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to whatever you have to tell us. It's a pleasure for me to stay here and connect with you. Uh, I agree, coronavirus is a great opportunity to change everything. Uh, people realize we are much more connected than we could imagine because we know you are in a globalized world, uh, the frontiers are not so important anymore. People travel in a, in a way that we never imagined few years ago, the last 20 years, people increased uh, the capacity uh, to travel and to know different countries, different people. But internet also connects people for a long time, since the very beginning. Uh, when I moved to Germany in 2006, internet was my main connection with uh, people in Brazil that I left. And uh, since then, I, I was experiencing not just uh, speaking with my family and friends, but also continuing analysis. Now we are, we are living an upside down reality. Our lives change from one hour for another. In my case, I was working in my office uh, Tuesday morning, the March, March 17th. And after lunch, I was working at home online because in few hours, clients start to ask for it because they are not uh, available to, to go out. They are working at home from one day to another. And then we have to adapt very quickly. But it's interesting when you say you live alone. Maybe it's a choice, maybe it's a circumstance of life. But even people living alone, uh, they used to have the option to meet people when they want. And now it's complicated. Uh, even people who, who are very introverted, uh, they are used to, to be alone for days and weeks. Uh, the fact that we can't go out, that we can't meet the people who, who are interested, uh, it's a lack of uh, freedom. Uh, that the virus took from us. That's very similar uh, what is going on now at the time of AIDS, HIV, when it started. We don't know who are contaminated. We don't know how to be contaminated. Uh, everybody was so uh, afraid to connect, to touch each other, because we don't know how the virus was uh, contaminating us. Uh, now we are passing for the same situation. Uh, the informations are changing day by day. We don't know how exactly how to protect ourselves, how to protect our family. 
And in, you are uh, just speaking to the screen now. What is very interesting, uh, I, I made very good friends that I never met personally. Very, very good friends. Uh, but it, it's different uh, for, for analysis. It's totally different to work. Uh, the quality of attention is different. Uh, our senses uh, are just vision and audition. Uh, we can feel the ambient and uh, the energy of the place we are connecting people. Uh, it, it's, a, it's much more work to do, to connect by, by the screen. But even so, people are very interested because we have the opportunity to meet people. We have great connections. Uh, we have uh, many things in common to, to speak about. That's the wonderful uh, uh, life in the internet I see. It's not a substitution, but it's very important. But uh, that's the way it is going on now. We can't change it for, for, for a long time, I imagine. I don't know how, uh, when things will change because we don't have a vaccine yet. We don't know exactly what is happening uh, in the countries that they are open, uh, the stores and the schools, we don't know what is going on. But uh, we have to deal with the lack of sense when we are speaking to the camera. Yes, <laughs> that, that's very difficult. But but one thing it has done is it's given us the opportunity to speak to a lot of well-known Jungian analysts, among other things. I was close friends with Thomas Arst, uh, who was the co-editor of Jung's Red Book for Our Time, as you know. And uh, he and I had uh, many things in common. Uh, and unfortunately, he died on Easter Sunday. I surmise it was actually from COVID for a couple of reasons, even though his family said it was a heart attack, but I, I think the proximate cause may have been COVID. So I decided to um, try to connect with some of the authors in uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, and uh, one of our friends and you often a participant here is uh, Louis LaFontaine, who I know uh, you know well, and Lewis uh, urged me to get in touch with you. And uh, I'm, I must say, I haven't gotten through your book on truth and the analytic process, but the, the parts that I have gotten into are uh, very interesting to me. Uh, the Imitation Game is one of my favorite movies, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and and Kira Knightley is one of my favorite actresses, but also because she played Sabina Spielrein in in uh, the Dangerous Method uh, in that movie, and um, uh, and Cassandra has always been an interesting mythological figure for me and. Uh, we actually named my now 40-year-old daughter, my youngest daughter, is named Cassandra. And, uh, it's a very strong name. Yes, and, and uh, she, she did not pick up the curse, but I found out it's me that has the curse. <laughs> uh, we're very grateful to have you here. I have a number of questions uh, from the book, but I think we'd like to have you Tell us about your book. Let me just introduce a, a few other people here uh, because uh, Jackie Solomon has joined us and uh, she's from Arizona. And Jackie um, has, has a nonprofit organization called uh, Seeds to Inspire. And she um, told us her story a couple of weeks back. And so that story is online here. And Jackie had a very heart-wrenching story in 
terms of losing her son at age 11 uh, very suddenly. And so it's a worthwhile thing to listen to. Jing Tan is here. Uh, she's an architect in Seattle, Washington, and uh, has been a faithful fo- uh, joiner of our sessions recently. And uh, Thomas Dennis is here, who um, is an author who lives in Alabama. Those are some of the people that participate here. Uh, Thomas has written many books also. For those people who haven't uh, seen your book, I wonder if you would um, just uh, tell us about it and, and how uh, you came to write it. And uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, thing to be talking about right now, particularly. I mean, I see that in our politics, both in the United States and in Brazil. Yes. <laughs> Please tell me how you correctly pronounce your name. Is it Solange or? Solange Bertolotto Solange. Schneider. Solange is French, Bertolotto Italian, and Schneider German. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, like a, a client said to me, I am practically the Second World War. Yeah. <laughs> a representative of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we, we'll we'll be quiet and let you talk. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, I don't think about the book since it was printed, because it's a hard work. It was a hard emotional work to speak about truth and all the problems. Uh, to to bring problems. Uh, the Bible says the true will free you, but actually true can curse you. And that's the, the reason I choose Cassandra. And uh, speaking with you now, um, maybe the idea about the truth uh, it started when I was around 20 years old. I was working in a company uh, with human resources. I was a psychology student at the time. And my bosses, uh, they are retired men from uh, the army. And they are retired from torture. They used to torture the political prisoners at that time. And then uh, I learned a lot with them because they tried to to make gossips all the time, to to spread lies, to manipulate uh, all the employees in the company, to, to take the control. Uh, by power and by uh, fear. Uh, that was an experience that was very strong for me at that time. And I, I think I spent my entire life to understand because the, the dictatorship in Brazil was a very traumatic experience. And, it, and now it's, uh, I don't know if you are at the risk again, but we have a president that uh, believes that uh, dictatorship is a good way to to govern to to be the president of Brazil. So, but the the main reason I decided to write about the truth uh, was political. Uh, that that's the reason. It was totally unconscious at the time. Uh, and for this reason, it leads me to Cassandra Meet and to the movie, because both are very political uh, and uh, in different uh, perspectives. But the problem of uh, truth and lies and secrets and the manipulation are present all the time. And that's the daily problem in psychoanalysis. Uh, people bring secrets to therapy. They bring a lot of uh, things that they don't tell us. Uh, 
sometimes they spend years uh, just speaking uh, around the problem, not the problem. And then uh, sometimes we have to respect it and not to, to try to extract the truth. But uh, walking around the main truth of the person's life, that's something I was dealing for my entire career. Uh, and uh, when I came back to Brazil in 2014, 2014, end of 2014, it was uh, before, a uh, few days before uh, elections for presidency. And uh, the day I arrived that I turned on the TV, the debates are so full of lies and gossips, like usually the political debates are, that I, I, I believe that I will be sick again, like I was during the dictatorship working with the torturers. It became the main uh, subject of my personal analysis. And uh, Cassandra uh, was a paper that I was uh, up to write for the Institute. We have to, to write some single papers for the Young Institute. My first one was about Young Sun. Uh, she's a Odisha from the Candomblé in Brazil, uh, a goddess. And the second one was Cassandra, because uh, the role of women, women uh, dealing with power relationships. Uh, as a woman, I was dealing with power relationships my entire life, at work especially. In personal relationships is part of life, but we have the choice to choose the partner. Uh, working is much more complicated. And uh, Cassandra always called my attention because uh, she has the truth. She has the power to know everything. And nobody believes her and because she was cursed, because the depends of men believe on her uh, for her to be heard. That is still a curse for the feminine. And the imitation game uh, is because the, not just the geniality of Alan Turing that I like very much, that character, but also because uh, homosexuality is being treated with the same kind of misogyny women has been treated for the patriarchal culture for 3000 years. I don't know uh, how long it is. Uh, and People try to, to discredit homosexuals in the same way they treat women. Uh, that's a, I, I, I think I speak about that in my book or in some article, that uh, the kind of prejudice women and homosexuality receives is for the same reason. We are not men, we are not the, uh, in charge of the power, and uh, they are not interested in have women and homosexuals having power because the, the way uh, women see the world, not exactly women, the feminine. Uh, some women are very patriarchal. And uh, why uh, women are not heard? That's a point. When we see companies, when you see families, uh, women are not heard. They can say the truth, they can say what is going on in the family, they can say don't do it because it will bring you a problem, and nobody takes in consideration. That's the, the normal, that's the normal situation in my practice. Uh, I'm not saying the uh, women are the only ones who knows the truth and are capable. Uh, many women are very neurotic as well and uh, play 
uh, power games in relationships, but is the curse of the feminine in our culture, not just the women. Uh, the feminine in our culture is cursed. We are, uh, we pretend, our society pretends that we are superior because we are capable to think, to produce knowledge and to have a spiritual life, but it covers a lot of shadow. Uh, we see in our world, um, matter is and misuse it and uh, treat it without respect in the same way uh, the feminine is treated in our culture. It's hard to speak about the things I, I imagine. And uh, my feeling when I read my own text uh, I say, I, why people will read it? Uh, sometimes I feel <laughs> feel bad reading this stuff because it's not it's not something pleasant to think about. Uh, it's not pleasant to to hear this kind of history uh, in the sessions as well, because we are in two thousand twenty. And we have the same problems uh, when I start to work with clients in 90, 1983. It's a long time ago, but the problems are the same. It's, it's interesting um, that there, there seemed there seemed to be some changes going on. One of them sort of manifested in this group a few weeks ago when one of our uh, members from Australia talked to us about all the things that had happened to her and her marriage and career uh, for over two hours, and then she she just changed her course and said, could we just have a talk about feminism and about whether feminism is appropriate? Um, and, you know, one, one aspect of this truth that you're talking about, and of course it was part of American politics very heavily in the, last part of the 20th century uh, is that it seems that, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong because I, I'm a man, so I don't see these things properly sometimes, but it seems that the feminists, the people that are very strongly feminist want to try to be men. They want to try to do the man at man activity a man a tip a masculine type of activity instead of a feminine type of activity they they have trouble sometimes depending on who they are and how they're educated uh, for example here at the naval academy which is two two miles from my house here they've accepted women in the student body since 19 76 and so now there have been uh, four-star admirals who are who are women who have been women the men have i mean have largely treated them until recent years pretty badly i know we sponsored some midshipmen over the years and they always wanted to be on a on a training vessel that didn't have any women on it because they didn't want they just didn't want to have any women around, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I've, I've always liked women around myself. So. <laughs> I, I think the role of feminine and masculine is very complicated. Uh, if you think in the fifties, uh, the roles are so uh, well explained. Everybody knows what to do. Yeah. Uh, how to relate to, to male, to female, it's easy. Now it's not easy anymore. 
people are changing and they we don't have clear rules anymore yeah. and some rules uh, sometimes are not fair because they're not respecting the nature of men and women uh, it's complicated i i say to my patients uh, you know uh, has no right and wrong now. We have to see what works for you and for your partner. Uh, respect, it's very important, but we also have to consider that, uh, uh, I was trying to read, but I can't read and speak at the same time. Uh, it's, it's not easy for, for us to change roles. Uh, we have a lot of projections in our partners, uh, not just uh, love partners and partners for work, co-workers. We expect some roles, but uh, we don't know mo anymore what is appropriate or not. Uh, some years ago, uh, sexual harassment in the work was common. Now it's crime. Uh, some kind of behaviors that was considered uh, uh, flirt, flirting, uh, now they are considered abuse. Uh, we don't know exactly what is personal and what is collective in our behaviors, in, your, in our relationships. And I think we need to speak about that. We need to think about that. Because sometimes we blame people because what they say, uh, the way they behave, but we don't look for the context. Uh, some educations are so uh, um, straight in, in, the, in the sense that uh, we don't have enough examples to have choices. We don't have uh, uh, scripts, different kind of scripts of behavior to, to try. Uh, now we start to have it, but people are still very attached for the models they received from their families. I remember when, when I was a child, uh, we have a big family. Uh, I, I, can, I could observe how my parents behave, but also my, my aunts and uncles and all the couples who are our friends with children. I had a lot of models, models of family. When I see now people are living in apartments, they don't relate with family, each member of the family in a different state, in a different country. Children are losing the opportunity to observe uh, that in, in, different kind of families exist. We need to speak about that in, in the television, in the in podcasts, in articles, but the experience uh, to see how they are different and how are many ways for a family work, and not just uh, the way mine works, sometimes works well, sometimes works very badly. But uh, it's nice to have uh, opportunity to see other examples. Yeah, yeah. Okay. See, I'm thinking about uh, the subject of, of feminism. And I agree that, that um, as Skip was saying, we men have a harder time plugging into that. And it seems to me that that what I keep in mind is that the great feminine has the, the quality of relatedness and that, that is what we are missing. It seems to me that the entire history of civilization is one of human beings trying to rise above nature, trying to have dominion over nature and forgetting that, that as many of the indigenous peoples realize we are in relationship and we have to be a partner in this. And so we see all over the world, uh, even, even arising out of places like rural Brazil, where there should be an indigenous influence, the same kind of, kind of greed that is uh, fostered by the, the dominant culture. I was, I've become aware that, that 
intimacy relies on a willingness to be penetrated. And so women are naturally so much more better equipped for that circumstance. And for a man, it is very hard for us to say, okay, I'm willing to be penetrated by, by whatever it is. You know, in the relationship, you have to be willing to compromise and to sacrifice and to be ready to support the other. And so for me, the image of being penetrated is perfect for that. I think about how I can support nature. The best way I can support it is to allow myself to be penetrated by the natural creatures and the, the two-leggeds and the, the four-leggeds and the winged peoples. So I, I try to keep that in mind that for me, embracing the feminism of the future is a willingness to be in relationship with everything. And if we end up uh, moving out into the stars, I very much hope we can be in relationship with whatever we find there and not just think about domination. Uh, women usually don't like what I have to say because I, I can't consider myself a feminist because uh, I don't want to, to be in fight. Uh, I, I think uh, men and women, uh, feminine and masculine principles should be in relationship. And uh, I'm not interested in, in power relationships. I want to understand how they work. And I don't think uh, the quality to be penetrated or to penetrate uh, really matters for me because uh, it's about to, to connect. And uh, the power relationships, uh, they install uh, intimacy in relationship. I don't think just women are losing uh, with the power relationships and to the, when they don't have a voice. I think men is losing. Men are losing because uh, men are seeking for love. What I see with my clients, men are seeking for love and intimacy. But uh, many times men are under some power games with their partners as well. It is going on for many, many years. Uh, the the gamey powers of seduction, uh, who has control for for whom, and uh, who is seducing, who are, are being seduced, uh, who are loving more, who is being more loved. It, it's a game in many relationships. Uh, I see it with my clients. And men are seeking for real connections. And women, um, many women are so hurt that they are not capable for this connection. Men and women are hurted. And uh, I don't think it's uh, helpful to speak about uh, uh, who has the power, uh, who hurts who. I think both are hurted. Because men need to be loved like women. It's the same feeling. It's uh, to be human. It's not about to be male or female. And uh, in this patriarchal, not, I can't blame only the patriarchal because we, feel we can back to the matriarchal societies. Men uh, were abused also. Uh, they are used to, to procreate and they, they don't have a role in the matriarchal societies. I think now we have the opportunity to commute uh, matriarchal and patriarchal and use uh, the best way to relate the two, uh, two archetypes have to offer. Uh, uh, I don't believe 
uh, relationship is just a fem female and an archetypal feminine uh, principle. Men are very good to relationship also. When you see uh, male friendship, uh, the feeling uh, of belonging to male groups, they are very, very important. Sometimes women are very jealous of that. It's true because uh, it, it's, um, it's a kind of a friendship without, uh, without gossip. It's very hard to see men speaking bad things about his friends. It's very common to see women speaking bad things about their female friends. That's something women can learn with men. Uh, loyalty. Women are competing for, for a role in society and for uh, including to have a good partner. It's still now to have a good marriage. Even women very well succeed professionally, uh, financially. They still look for a good partner, uh, a man who has good income and a good profession and so on. It's part of the culture. We can blame women and men because of that, but we, we have to discuss it. Uh, why we are still so uh, uh, enclosed in these patterns of relationship. We are not free to, to choose just because uh, we like the company, not because it's a good uh, a good person to expose in the social media and our social life. Uh, we, we, we need to, to change some paradigms. And it's not easy because we are all trained to repeat the, the education we received. And uh, we are, the, the, the number of uh, subtle informations about how to behave, uh, about gender, about age, about profession, about uh, all the personas uh, we have is immense. If you look for an article in a female magazine or in a male magazine, we see all the stereotypes being reinforced and teach it. Uh, the female magazines for a long time, now the magazines are, uh, are not existing anymore because everything is online and many magazines are not available anymore. But uh, one day I was analyzing uh, the, the text in uh, the cover of a, a female magazine uh, in, in the same cover has uh, lessons how to be a, a best sexual partner, how to make the man uh, crazy about you, uh, how to be independent, how to not take, uh, how to not care about what the other think about you, uh, how to lose weight and exercise to, to be fit. All in one cover, they are not, uh, they are totally contradictory. If you see the male magazines, um, they are very similar. How to be the most uh, seductive man in, the, in, in your society, how to conquer uh, the most beautiful women, uh, how to make money to, to impress women. Uh, it's all about stereotypes. What is men and what is human, women if we, we take off all the stereotypes? We don't know. Some then, of them are natural. Some of them are cultural and they change. Uh, I didn't do a, a good research about that. Maybe I should do it. But uh, this is changing. What is beauty is changing. What is desirable is changing. What is archetypal? What is nat natural? And what is cultural? I've been teaching uh, some classes on 
body image because I'm a, I'm a figurative sculptor and all my life I've been making sculptures mostly of wood bodies. And I started to realize 30 years ago that, that the body that I was experiencing was not the same body as the culture was aware of. And I started to, uh, to look at why that is. What is it about the body that, that is so uh, alarming to us? And I think the case is worse in the US than it is anywhere else because of our, of our uh, Puritan upbringing by this religious sect that, that really apparently theologically thinks that human bodies were created by mistake. Either that or that God is just this cruel overlord that wants to give us all these desires and then watch us squirm while we break all the rules. And um, so the, in, a, in the American psyche, I'm sorry, the US psyche, um, it seems as though we are constantly swimming upstream against a feeling that our bodies are really not okay. And so I've been really curious looking at women's magazines and men's magazines that we see the same images over and over. We see these very scantily clad women, young, you know, sexy, uh, fertile women. And I think I've been thinking about what does that mean for the collective? We are obviously striving to absorb the nutrients of that young mother image. And to me, everybody was born of a mother. We were born into the universe of the mother's body. And so that image of the young, sexy woman is not so much about uh, male desire as it is about religious longing for a connection with the divine. And I think it helps us to try to separate those issues a little bit because, of course, women are being abused by the same sorts of of desires and images that the a lot of the men's magazines have emulated with just t turning women into objects and at the same time i feel there's this very uh beautiful religious longing for the great feminine that we see behind these same images and if you look at art history you know the oldest sculptures in the world are these beautiful images of the fertile women and and i think the primitive mind that created those sculptures 30 40 thousand years ago is the same mind that we have inside of us today and so all of this complexifies the whole issue but i love hearing what you have to say like that that we are inherently all of us want to be in relationship we want to have this intimate connection with each other and what we need what we need to do is get all the garbage out of the way and just be able to see that there's a real human being that we can connect to with i think tim we have a collective complex about relationship uh, it's not enough to work the personal complex because we have a cultural complex about what, what's to be successful, what is to be loved, how to, to deal with it. I remember that movie, uh, Perfume, when the guy creates a perfume from dead women, uh, he desires to be loved. He was trying to create a perfume that uh, people will love him. Uh, all we need is love. That's, that's simple. Uh, everybody does a lot of great things because we want to be loved. Uh, 
uh, and what kind of sacrifices uh, we are capable to do for for it. And uh, when you think, uh, when you say that uh, women women's body are objectified, uh, many women are objectifying their own bodies. Uh, I was scared uh, when I realized it. Most part of my clients did some kind of uh, plastic surgery. Uh, some did it very young, very, very young. And uh, not just in Brazil, uh, I saw the same in Switzerland. I didn't know in Switzerland they are very addicted to, to plastic surg surgery. I don't know if it is in the statistics because Switzerland is a tiny country. Maybe they don't have enough numbers to, to compete with the numbers in Brazil and in the United States. But uh, we have a great number of people that are not satisfied with their appearance. appearance. Uh, not just women, men also. Men doing uh, hair transplant, men doing plastic surgery, and many aesthetical treatments. You are in the phase of uh, Instagram, uh, changed a lot. Now is Instagram who is uh, taking the best uh, uh, figures. And uh, I am very scared because uh, some friends that I meet, I can't recognize because I, I stopped to see them for some years. When I met them in person, it's scary because they are not the persons I, I, I remember from the photos. And not just the plastic surgery, but all the, the photoshops and many resources we have now. And now uh, I was in... Uh, just a minute, someone is doing a lot of noise here. I have to ask them to stop. We live uh, a big persona life. Uh, I was in a chat group another day, and some colleagues are saying, if we continue doing uh, Zoom all the time, I need a Botox. Uh, I can't you stay in front of the camera with this face. I need to go to her dryer, to, to hairdressers, to, to, to do my hair, and so on, uh, in the middle of pandemic. And, and I have men uh, doing aesthetical treatments uh, this week. Uh, instead of uh, uh, stop the, the necessity to increase the, the persona, I think the the virtual life is increasing the urge to, to, to look better because the, the other senses are not present. Because uh, sometimes you, you meet someone that is not so beautiful, but you feel so comfortable in the presence of that person. The person is very interesting. The energy around is so nice. We feel so comfortable. We need to to make friendships. Sometimes we, we fell in love for someone just because we feel the entire person. Now you are living uh, through the screen and then we don't know, uh, we don't have the other senses to help us to make a judgment about the personality. We have to stay just what the other are saying and how they're looking. We don't have the smell the smell and is one of the most primitive senses uh, in hearing. Uh, a, child, a child can hear and recognize her mother's voice. Uh, I don't remember, I, I wrote it in my book, but I have a bad, very bad memory. Uh, very early during pregnancy, uh, a child can, can recognize the mother's voice because inside the uterus, uh, the sound is uh, like, a, I don't remember the words in English, like a sound box. And then uh, a child can, rec can recognize mother's voice. Uh, with microphone, the voice is, is 
altered is not the real voice. Uh, many senses are, um, are, yes, they can recognize tones and music is also. Thomas Dennis is saying, it's true. And now we are, we are too much visual, visual. Our society is too much visual. I am a very visual person, but when I am just using the screen, I realize that I'm not so visual at all. Uh, the, the rest of the senses are very important for me. What I say in my book is um, uh, to realize the truth and to have a, a true experience and a true knowledge, we need all the senses. We need all the sensorial sense. We need the, the subconscious information. Uh, with the screen, it's difficult because I can't look to everyone here. I can pay attention in one image and other. But if I am in a room with all of you, I can pay attention in many movements at the same time. I can sense uh, what is going on, if you are interested or not. Uh, who is more comfortable or not with the screen is very difficult. Yeah, I want to share one thing. It's interesting because in China they have this new camera, uh, actually Huawei, which is banned in many countries. But one function they have actually they take the the V even they beautify you instantly, so you don't need to do any plastic surgery. <laughs> so my friend even said, my friend said. No makeup needed now. We'll just take a picture. You already they make up for you in the picture automatically. I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, the problem is when you meet the the person. Uh, it's I, a totally I, different I, person. I pass, I pass for some troubles because uh, I'm very sincere and uh, I wasn't capable to to hide my surprise. Uh, and it's, it's complicated because uh, imagine you have a good friend you don't see for a few years and we speak by through the camera and you see the photos when you meet the person uh, in real life uh, it doesn't matter it's, it's not the same person including the voice was not the same uh, uh, our memories can betray us because we yeah. used to, to, to memorize the, the last few memories we have. Uh, what to do? It's, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys see Vera Wang's new pictures. Vera Wang, the lighting dress designer. She's in her 60s or 70s. She looked like 20 years old. She had these great figures and do all this fit. As well. She looks even better than she was 20 or 30 years old. <laughs> it's amazing. It's yeah. funny, like I found, you know, I'm always drawn to these people who look nice. You know, I think it's naturally. But then when we were at the landmark meeting, then they always share they are insecure about their look. And I found those people who are insecure about look actually take better care of themselves and they look better. So that's very ironic, you know. I'm kind of lazy, you know. I don't care about how people think about me. So I don't really put much effort. But I found all this joy that I think maybe for other people, I need to do some effort too, because I like to see people, you know, look nicer who care about other people think. So maybe they want to see somebody else. I, I need to do effort to them, not to myself, maybe. It's kind of, it's come, you know, come make out. What do you do with I, this? I think, I think uh, appearance is a very complex uh, subject because uh, I had a teacher many, many years ago uh, it was an uh, alternative course. I, I did a lot of crazy uh, stuff in my life. It, is one, it was one course uh, very strange, but uh, it's very strange people. I like very much strange people. And then uh, one of the teacher was a very well-dressed woman. Uh, she was always well-presented. And someone started to criticize her because she was very in her image. She was um, 
not uh, like the others and so on. And she gave an answer that is very interesting. Until today, I think it's interesting. She said, I came here, uh, I will expose a class for, for you for two hours, three hours. Uh, at least I have to be presentable. Uh, I don't want you to see me without a shower, without combing my hair. I want, I, it's, a, it's a way I show to you, I respect you, I am prepared, not uh, my mind is prepared to teach what I have to teach, but I prepare myself entirely to be present here. Uh, it was a great uh, lesson for me because it's also about respect. Uh, sometimes uh, the frontier of respect and to begging for love and begging for acceptance is crossed uh, because it's not just about the self appearance. Some people uh, want to be proud about the appearance of their partners as well. Uh, some, uh, when our President Bolsonaro, he has, every day he says something that could be a good example for psychopathology. Uh, he criticized uh, Macron's wife. Because Dr. Was, Schneider, could you just raise your mic up again? Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, she, he criticized Macron's wife because she was too old, she wasn't beautiful like his wife and Trump's wife. Uh, it's, a, it's the concept of women trophy. Uh, some women now has the concept of a man trophy. Uh, this man is not enough uh, well good looking to, for me to present him or her as a partner. Uh, it, it's a kind of uh, disturbance of uh, image as well, projected in the partner. And uh, again, I remember I, when I was a child, I had very good examples of very happy and lovely couples. And some of them, they are not beautiful at all. But they are, I have the memory of how they are caring to each other, how they love each other, how they are respectful. And sometimes I see people so young, so beautiful, so nice looking, so rich, so well prepared, so intellectually well prepared, and so uh, uh, disrespectful, so selfish. They are not really in relationship. Something is missing. Something is missing, and I think it's self-respect is missing, and respect for the other is missing. We need to, to, to give a way to, to deal with this problem with persona in our society. Uh, uh, too much shadow is hidden. Uh, when the, sh the persona is so uh, important, the shadow is growing in a way that we can't control. It's so uh, sad to see. Uh, people hidden partners because they are not the, they don't look like uh, they, they want to, to present them to society. It's scary. Yeah. I, I'd like to ask a, a question that relates to truth and secrets, okay? Mm -hmm. And related to interpersonal relationship. Um, one time many years ago, and this is not didn't happen with my current wife, but it happened with my first wife, where it was a time when the style, the hairstyle, was very bouffantish hairstyle, mm -hmm. right? And my wife went to a hairdresser and had had her hair all well done. And I'm a very introverted guy, so I don't really necessarily notice things that are outside me and she came home she got really angry at me that i didn't compliment her hair 
and very frequently we hear of men getting in trouble because their wife says, well, do you like my hair? Because they come home from the hairdresser and they, they like that. Uh, uh, or they want to be complimented, obviously. They want to be complimented, especially by a spouse, right? I don't understand the, the, what the secrets have to well, do with that. Well, the I don't secret, understand. I, yeah, let me get to the secret. The secret okay. is the, secret is the um, insecurity of the woman. She needs the, she, her secret is that she feels insecure and she, she wants this compliment. And when it doesn't come, then, then she's, you know, feels disrespected, surely. I mean, there's, a, there's an issue of respect in there as well. I think Vinicott likes this. Because every, Vinicott likes this example because uh, everyone wants to be seen. It's the first uh, sign of love uh, is to be seen, recognize it. Uh, but men is different than women. Uh, I always try to explain to my clients, uh, uh, women and, and men are different. We, ne we have to learn that we are different and we have to respect the difference and understand. Otherwise, we will fight for full, uh, very foolish uh, arguments. Uh, it's very interesting when you say, because... Uh, when a, a female client describes the partner, usually the description is very real. When I see the figure, uh, I was expecting something, someone very gorgeous, it, it really was. When a man describes a woman, I never know what I will see when they show me the picture. Because men see, see things differently and women need to understand we have some men here you can say to me if I'm right or I'm wrong. Men look to a detail and they like very much that detail of that woman. And she's totally beautiful because that detail, that detail is the men uh, think they look at and it's enough. I had a client once, uh, he had a, a wife and a mistress. And uh, one day he decided to show me the photo of the both beautiful women in his conception. Uh, both the wife and the mistress, they have a, a mouth big like a giant with big teeth out of the mouth that they can't uh, uh, close her mouth, both of them. And they consider it both very, very beautiful women. Uh, maybe other people will not consider that, but for that man, man with a big mouth, uh, big teeth, uh, out of mouth for him, it was very attractive. And I experienced it with men, men, when, when they bring the photos, and today, more than ever, uh, everybody brings photos. Uh, it's part of the session, see photos and see uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, chats. It's part of the sessions. And uh, usually, uh, I never know what you see when a man shows a photo of the wonderful woman they are dating. Sometimes they are really gorgeous, sometimes they are much more beautiful than they are describing. And some are just regular persons, but it's about love. It's about love, it's about intimacy, it's about connection. Uh, women, when they describe relationship, they separate. They describe the, the, how they look and how they feel the person. Men, uh, in my experience, it's all mixed. Maybe I'm wrong. May I say something, Skip? Yes. Uh, along those lines, uh, um, I, I totally agree with you. It's all about love and it's all about yes. connection. And Skip, I don't think it was your wife having insecurity about her appearance. What, what, what she was trying to say was, um, pay attention to me. You know, love requires attention and love doesn't ignore. 
doesn't look the other way. Real love actually involves, you know, giving and, and working together. And working together meaning this exchange. And she wanted to connect with you. She took energy to make herself beautiful, to attract you, to please you. And sometimes we women do that too much. And um, mm -hmm. when we do it too much and we don't get any feedback from it, you know, we feel disappointed. And um, you, you need to do it. Uh, I mean, real love actually involves, you know, enjoying to give the attention to another and hopefully to receive it. So it, and we do it because it feels good. Like if we do dress up and we do put on makeup and we do, you know, get the feedback that, oh, wow, you know, um, you, I pleased him. It, it makes us feel good. And, it, and we want to do it to the point where when we give, we, we give without feeling like it's a chore. It's, we do it out of love and pure joy. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I want to say, uh, because the same thing happened to my husband. Every time I do my hair, he didn't use, hey, did you do your hair? <laughs> Look the same. <laughs> but anyway, I want to say, I think the love language, I think you guys all know about, we did a test, you know, I think people have different love language. Sometimes it doesn't match. But another thing I want is, I always wonder, is love is like, naturally happened or is uh nurture you know like you know it's uh, it's there because i really admire the relationship between kent and simon de Beauvoir. i think they are the true soulmate you know this are this are the ideal you know love in my vision but i don't see it happens everywhere else <laughs> you know i think the two persons have to be so independent and special they can really meet their soulmate so when i was dating i actually could ask looking for soulmate, <laughs> but it never happened. So I met my husband who totally opposite of me, but we worked well to, but together. I told him, you know, you're not my soulmate. I need to look for my mate. <laughs> but I realized, is that possible? Um, I don't see anybody Find a soulmate, soulmate is very complicated because it implies <laughs> a lot of projection of anima and animals. And then uh, when you realize you are with a real person, just part of the projection were real, part of the projection were not real. And you have to deal yeah. with the person entirely. And it's so frustrating many times. Uh, people are very romantic until nowadays, very, very romantic. But I, I would like to come back to the secret. Uh, you speak about the secret. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure uh, the main reason of your ex-wife was she secretly was insecure. I think a secret is something much more complicated than it. Because uh, people usually, uh, we lead a lot of secrets in sessions. And people uh, are very afraid to tell secrets. Uh, it's, it's not easy to tell a secret because the consequences, uh, we never know what will happen when a secret is revealed. Uh, people sometimes idealize, like in the confession, uh, you confess uh, to the priest or to the analyst and everything will be fine because I don't have a secret anymore, I will be free. It's not true. Uh, to, to tell a secret has many consequences. And the consequences is you have to deal with the new reality. When you bring a very important and new information, sometimes you realize that the information is not new. Everybody uh, uh, around you was aware about your secret, just waiting the opportunity to, to speak about that because the secret for you it's very common in homosexuality. Uh, people spend sometimes years and years uh, before speaking with the family. When they speak, the family was aware. They are just waiting for the authorization 
to, to ask questions? Are you in love with someone? This good friend is your partner or is just a friend? Uh, it's it, it much more complicated than that. Sometimes uh, people are not aware. They are in, in negation of the, the reality. And then uh, you have to fight to expose your reality because even if it's true, people decide to not believe. We, we are having this problem now with the coronavirus. We, we can give all the information, the true information we have about that, and people decide if they believe in science or not. That's another point I discussed in my book. Uh, why uh, people believe in what they believe. Uh, belief is not rational. Belief uh, is against uh, knowledge, it's against science, it's, uh, it's totally emotional. We choose to believe uh, in something because we are many times driven by our complexes and then it's much more comfortable to believe than to confront the reality and the truth. We have this in Brazil and in the United States about coronavirus and all the, the politics are doing uh, around the a real problem. Some people in Brazil, they don't believe the virus exists. Yeah. I'm very interested in, in why uh, people are so... Uh, driven by, by beliefs. We have many religions that are stolen money from people, uh, they are destroying their lives, but they believe that's the way. That's the, the, the way to redemption or something like that. But it's, it's very close to the sense of belonging. If a group uh, believes in something, it's very difficult to to, to go away. Uh, I, I, I did recently the analysis of the movie Jojo Rabbit. Mm. And that, that movie is very nice. The boy has, Hitler has his imaginary friend. And uh, all the construction of belief, uh, beliefs about the, the Nazi movement uh, and how boys are encouraged to be part of a young Nazi group. It, it was much more about being part of a group, to be accepted, to be loved, uh, than to do uh, uh, a real connection with the Nazi ideology. Many people are just there because they have no option. They don't have the, the opportunity to think and to discuss and to confront the reality. But even so, it's a great challenge for me. Uh, I'm trying to understand it for a long time. Uh, also because the dictatorship, are you yeah. not listening then, uh, yeah. Marius? Marius, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schneider. Very interesting. I've got a page of notes here. And there's many things I'd like to pursue, but um, what you said really jumped out. And the, the first sign of love is to be seen. And I know how my wife would answer that. And I'll, I'll admit, you know, I'm a typical man. And I guess I'll speak for myself if nobody wants to agree with me, who's also men, men here. Um, but I think I'm more capable of disassociating myself from life. And a strange thing happened either yesterday or the day before. And I was just in a very meditative state and thinking about, you know, all, all that we've been talking about here on this channel. And just for a brief flash, I had a sensation like as though I had a womb, that I had a uterus and that I could produce life inside me. And it freaked me out. You know, it really did. 
Um, I just don't think we tip men, again, speaking for myself, go through life um, thinking about what a, what a profound thing, you know, to carry another human being in yourself. We're just, I'm just disassociated a lot of the time. But um, the question is, again, back to the first sign of love is to be seen. Do, do you and other women here feel the feminine is being seen adequately? You know, in this planet, on this planet. Can I say something? Yes. Uh, um, Miles, I, um, I think right now we're going through a shift, and, um, and I agree with Thomas that there's too much yang going on in this world. So there's a harmonious attempt to balance with the, the yin, <laughs> yin, yin. And um, yeah, I think you can see it in um, corporations. There are women who are CEOs of major corporations. And in the movies, you have superwoman and all of these images of um, women coming in, um, in, into the play in a man's world. Um, so it is, um, it is happening. And right now, sometimes we feel that it's not happening fast enough or enough, but it's, it's making some headways. And now the new generation of um, girls, um, I, I see it, it very differently. I'm sure I see the, like what you see, Tim, you know, in the magazines, the, you know, scantily um, skinny dressed women and, and so forth. Um, that's there, but I also see, like, in stores, they've got um, stores for, um, you know, big women, <laughs> and um, they're, they're addressing that. So I, I think, um, again, looking on the positive side, we're moving in that direction. We're, we're um, eventually going to reach a balance, but it's going to take um, – quite a bit of time. But also, um, getting back to the point of um, attraction, I was watching a National Geographic on birds. And you know um, who has the fanciest plumes? It's the male. The peacock has all the feathers <laughs> in a nature, you know, you got the drama, right? They, they've got the, they have to make the effort to attract the women. And the women look pretty downy. They're in, you know, gray, black, brown, you know, very bland, bland <laughs> colors. But it's the it's the guys, man. The guys got the the color, the, <laughs> you know, the drama. Like uh, attract me, have sex with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what can I say? You know, <laughs> viva la différence makes it fun. Yeah, but, uh, I did a bunch of drawings a few years ago of. Uh, what would happen to the human species if that was true about about the human male? I did all these men with, you know, these feathers and other decorations that trying to impress the women. <laughs> I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> well, men do. We we do try to impress the women, uh, of course, um, and. Uh, I, I always like the the three simple things of the osprey, which is the male has to do a sky dance. Number one, he has to um, bring a fish so that he can feed the female, and then he has to build a nest. And only then is then is he invited to mate with the female. You know, we we all do that in in some way. One of, one of the questions that always has disturbed me, I mean, a lot of good wisdom has come up here, but how, how do we get it into the schools so that, so that younger people know something about what they should be doing and, and so on? And it's not just left to mama and papa to, to uh, advise or, you know, it's not just left to the, to the locker room or the 
um, you know, the coffee shop, but is, you know, we, don't we need to teach people a little bit better how about things like, you know, people just want to be seen. I mean, that's a, that's a very simple mm -hmm. psychological idea. Why can't that be taught from kindergarten, for example? Um, so that people understand themselves a little better. Well, you know, that, that's always been a big issue with me. But th <clears throat> there's been some interesting chat here as you've been talking. And <laughs> Thomas Dennis asked <clears throat> the question, why do relationships degrade or, you know, fall, fall apart? I wonder if you have any general wisdom on that so much. <laughs> it's very complicated because each case is one case. But uh, the first thing I see is the lack of respect. When you start to don't respect and don't have admiration for your partner, uh, you are one, one step to stop loving. Uh, Admiration is very important in a relationship. Uh, I think uh, having um, similar ethical uh, beliefs are very important also. Uh, people, uh, couples who disagree with uh, small things but have a f philosophy of life very similar in the big decisions, uh, they they used to stay together longer uh, it's it's much more it's much more complicated than love and sexuality it's about uh, to feel connected to have the same principles uh, many couples start to fight when they have children because the, their values start to appear so different uh, how to educate a child is the one of the main moments that you show your inner values. What you teach for a child, uh, how you teach them to respect, how you teach them uh, to relate with others, how to choose a school with a philosophy of life closer to the family. Uh, uh, I see many clients start to have troubles in relationship after having child because uh, the main things that they never uh, speak about before about the, the inner beliefs, their philosophy of life, their principles, ethical principles are very, very important. Uh, it's easy to see criminals together in love because they have the same values. Uh, couples uh, is stealing and being criminals, but they are happy together. They have the same values. But if you have a criminal with an honest person, probably will not match for a long time. Uh, it's not possible. And the other thing I see is uh, to be seen and to be heard. It doesn't mean that I just listen to you and uh, I answer um, anything, uh, is to stay really connected and to... Uh, is he? Uh, is really connected. Uh, I am speaking to you and you are paying attention. Uh, when you ask questions to me, it, they are pertinent to what I'm saying. You are listening attentively. Uh, that's it's a really connection we are having here but we we see many families that uh, people are saying oh I'm giving uh, a lecture next week uh, I'm so excited and nobody pays attention when the day of the lecture arrives and nobody cares they they are not prepared they don't respect it uh, there, there are many ways to not listen but I want to come back to you, Miles, when you, you speak about your experience to have a uterus. Uh, it was a very important experience. Many women didn't, don't have this 
experience to feeling connected with the creative process of life. I, I'm not sure it is a dissociation, but probably it is a numinous experience of being connected to the fem female principle. Uh, because uh, it's not just women who are capable to create life. Men are creating life by art, uh, by reading, by making connection uh, between people. Uh, the creative principle is much more complex, uh, obviously giving life uh, uh, for having a child, it's a material way to, to, to create life, but sometimes it's not connected with the real meaning of giving birth to a child. We have sometimes women having a uterus, having a child being pregnant, raising a child without any connection. Uh, they are not uh, connected with the female principle. Uh, it's much more complicated than having a uterus and having a pregnancy going to the terms. If I could just add a few couple more things, because um, that's, that's exactly where I, I came to a point about five years ago where I had to, I had some, I'm still on this career decision journey and, and it's like, okay, I've, I've, been, I've been laid off from my job. Now, what am I going to do? And so I started to think, well, what is important What's meaning and purposeful in, in life? You know, because my background is civil engineering and, you know, my education was nothing but, okay, this is how you build something. This is how, you know, different kinds of excavators and how you lay railway track. And, and you know, the problem is, though, that um, the planet is under some very serious stress. But my education was just all about, as Skip says, pointed out, logos. Very little, next to nothing about eros in my formal education about life, eros as in life. And uh, five years ago, I came across a quote by Hegel, the philosopher that said, everything that we experience, every learning, every relationship, encounter, good or bad, it's pointing to truth or as we've come to agree i think here that the truth is there's many paths to truth um and then it wasn't until meeting skip and learning about young and this journey of individuation that uh, and we've talked also a lot of, about the divine feminine so um, without coming into this conversation with Skip and everyone here, this idea of individuation uh, would have not manifest. I, I had never heard of that term before, but it very much related to what I shared about Hegel. So uh, I guess in summary, it's made me capable of, of realizing that I've been rather disassociated from life and to think about the anima and the stages of these, the women that we've talked about with uh, culminating in the anima mundi. And uh, so profound change for me and my outlook. Thank you. Uh, may I ask something? So I don't know if you notice Adele, the singer, British singer, you know, who recently returned. She become very skinny, you know, like big change. So we are talking about kids' education. I think actually kids, I have two teens, which I'm totally headache with, you know. But I get, like, I get married. I have this plan for my life to get married at 30, have kids before 35. And it seems like perfect plan, <laughs> but didn't work out that well, you know. It's funny, like, how we have this idea about life. But anyway. I think the kids, I read a, recently learned books about teen education and they said, you know, at teen age, they don't really, they try to disconnect with their parents. They get more influenced by the peers because they want to feel more independent. So I think in that way, you know, the idols, the singer, Billy Ellis, 
you know, Baby Alice. I really like her because she's really true to herself. You know, she's she wears this huge clothes. She's very pretty, and she used to be a dancer. I think she has some kind of problem with uh, some kind of uh, things, and she wearing this very big clothes, and she be herself. She still beautiful song, and she becomes very famous. I think she become very popular, not just because of her song, but because she is true to herself. But on the other hand, we have Adele, who is a very talented singer, who used to be this bigger size. Now she's like become like, she is pretty. And we got this perfect model. It's like the image we want her to be. So is that a good thing or bad thing? Sometimes you know, it's hard to know. Like, you know, everybody has potential, you know, like maybe she fulfilled her one set of talent potential, then she wants to be better herself, you know, in another way. You know, that's good. But the other side, they tell us, you know, being chubby may be not uh, a suitable image for it, for the other people. So it's, I don't know, what's the better balance, you know, for this? It's difficult to know because it's private. Uh, sometimes people start analysis and they start to lose weight uh, because their anxiety is low down and they change for health habits, not because they are doing a diet. Uh, sometimes people start analysis, they start to put weight because the process uh, is so hard that they need more mass around them to, to feel more strong. Uh, a, a client of mine, she was really obese and she, she did a very well succeed treatment once and lost a lot of weight. And then uh, one day she decided that she will give up the diet because she doesn't feel comfortable in her skinny body. Uh, she said, uh, I feel people are too close. I can't keep the enough distance. And she decided to to be fat again, not so fat that her health will be compromised, but she said that my equilibrium uh, needs more weight. Uh, of course, it was a person with uh, many troubles, with a very tragic history, and she decided that then uh, for her mental health, it was better to keep some weight. Uh, it, it, uh, it's very complicated. To be skinny sometimes is a nightmare. People don't feel comfortable in their bodies. Uh, doesn't matter how you appear. Uh, you can feel comfortable in, in a very ugly body that nobody is uh, thinking they are nice. I had a, I like strange people. Then I had a, a very good friend that she was around 40, 40 years older. I was young and she was 40 years old and we are very good friends. And she was uh, not very beautiful and she had awful legs, awful, uh, full of veins, uh, full of dark spots and so and she was always using shorts. She was not young. She was using shorts and skirts. And one day she was with me and she said, I love my legs. Uh, I love my legs so much. And I said, yes, what do you love about your legs? She said, my legs are strong. I can walk for many hours. I can go to everywhere. My legs give me freedom to be who I am and to go to where I want to go. Uh, it was a good lesson, you know. Uh, people can love themselves in the way they, they are. Uh, it's not about be pretty or not being pretty, to be accepted or not to be accepted. It's an inner image. And this inner image starts in the beginning of your, the formation of your personality. In the very, very early age, when you are nearly born. And then it's something that is not well fit when you are very, very young. Uh, it's a big trouble to, to fix it. 
it's not easy to deal with the self-image. And I, I think society never helped, uh, never helped uh, Lewis uh, uh, separated some quotes of my book. And one of them, uh, uh, I say that uh, the image, uh, the person we have now in Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, is not new. Uh, when you see the portraits of uh, kings and queens and important persons, they are all transformed by the artists. They are not allowed to, to portray it how they are. Uh, some are portrayed taller, uh, fatter because uh, it was important at that time, uh, hiding some parts of the body. Uh, uh, it, it's not new. It's not new. Okay. Hey, I wonder. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. I want to change the topic. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I want to say it's interesting. I observe. I found, you know, when people are actually in a happy relationship, they don't really tend to change themselves most of the time. So when people are single or in, not in a relationship, they start to make all this effort to make the move. Maybe just like they're trying to pursue their next mate, so they need to work out themselves. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Sometimes it's a lack of respect, no? when you are not taking care of yourself, of the other, when you are in the relationship. It's not just about the appearance, it's about the, the treatment. Uh, sometimes I say to the couples, I see, I say, you have to treat yourself like you treated the strangers, because intimacy is making you treat you without respect, without any consideration. Uh, it's not because you are in love, you are living together, you are married, that you can say everything that passes uh, through your mind. You have to filter it. You have to elaborate it. And to think uh, if you uh, uh, are being aggressive, if you are respecting others' feelings, because uh, intimately people think, uh, now I can be seen like I am, I don't need to, to pretend I'm another person. It, they, they lost the sense of respect. It, it's so sad to see. But many couples who come to therapy, they came for stupid motives. They start to respect, they stop to respect each other, they stop to treat them with consideration in a lovely form. Well, thanks, Dr. Schneider. Um, I'm, I find that I'm really haunted by something that you started the session with, which is talking about counseling torturers. I did uh, some work with Archbishop Tutu many years ago when he was working on the, uh, the, Recon the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, trying to get to move forward into a community that could live together despite all of the horrors that had happened during the apartheid regime. And I'm, I'm sure that some of that is happening in Brazil because the, the memory of the dictatorship is still there. And, uh, I find myself just appalled that a person can get to the point where they can torture somebody during the afternoon and then go home and have dinner with their wife and kids and, you know, ask about their day and stuff like that. I'm just wondering what kind of insights you came away from that experience with, if you could share something about well, that. Well, uh, this man, um, he was my boss. He was... I should have around 20 at that time. She was 65, she was retired. And uh, she, he, he wants very much to, to tell me uh, about the torture sections he, he worked in. And I was always saying to him that I, I wasn't interested in, in listening to the details. And then uh, he, 
one day he decided to to make a trap uh, to he wants to to make someone being fired from the company and he made a trap for uh, two young employees to but his target was the boss and he came to me very proud uh, to tell all the strategies he took to prove that that persons are not uh, trustful to work to the company and um, he used uh, my one of my arguments that one of the employees i was against to to have in the company because uh, all the tests all the interviews i did uh, and other psychologists in the company uh, showed that the guy was uh, potentially a criminal he was he he had the many many signs that he would be a trouble in the company and the guy was hard and then uh, this guy made a trap for them and for another girl at the time the girl was studying history uh, history and philosophy students was considered criminals and uh, during dictatorship there are potential communists and potential crimin criminals against the regime and he wants to fire this girl she was 18 years old with a crippled father and uh, his, he, her brother was down, with Down syndrome. She was the only one in the family who was working to bring food for the family. And then he was very proud and uh, trying to convince me how good he was to, to took the trash to the company. And I said to him, uh, I told him the history of the girl she was only 18 and being the provider for her entire family and then i i didn't agree with his attempt to convince me that he was right and i said to him i'm very sad that she was fired uh, she was a good person she was so young and she didn't deserve what you did and this man he started to cry and he left. That was the first time that I see some emotion on him. It was very interesting because he needs my approval. I, I, until today, I didn't understand why she, he was looking for my approval. And he never had it. But that was the first moment that I have hope that uh, he could change, that he could uh, start to think about his entire life because he wasn't totally convinced about his method, about the way he took his life. But uh, of course, I, I left the company some time uh, after it and I heard awful things he did in the company. Uh, he didn't learn nothing, you know. Uh, it, it's very complicated when a person has the power to uh, about others' life, about others' job. It's a kind of perversion. Uh, I don't think it's only about to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, because people who are not capable to be perverted like that, they can't survive for long. They, they die, they become sick, uh, they have a way to go out of it. This man was too old and uh, he wasn't capable to change. He was interested in maintaining his way of life. Uh, it was a good lesson for me because, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we have a lot of hope that psychology, psychotherapy can change everybody. Sometimes a person is really bad, a person is really bad, it doesn't matter what you do in analysis, 
that will not change her uh, his character. Uh, and I had experienced it in, with some clients, not too much, fortunately, hopefully not too much. But some uh, has a very, uh, they have a criminal minds. Uh, they are so uh, in charge of aggressiveness that I don't know how many lives of therapy will be enough to change it. Uh, 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 a colleague of mine once said some some people need two or three lives to to change one one life of therapy will not be enough and this guy i think it was one of these cases because he was very he was very sadistic he had a lot of pleasure tell me all the tortures it was very sadistic and he needs public to hear his histories. Uh, then uh, I think that's the reason many sadistic and narcissistic people like to be politicians and to be famous, because they need attention. They need to convince people that I, I'm capable to make you suffer and you have nothing to do. I am powerful. I don't know why we come to this. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I have uh, another question here, uh, which is uh, from your book, and there's a quote that I highlighted here, which is, truth is, is an experience of wholeness. Synchronistic events are an attempt to unify the psyche and matter, as they are two meaningful parts of the same event. And so I wonder, um, I mean, th those are two sentences side by side. Uh, I wonder if you just speak about, first of all, truth is an experience of wholeness. If you could expand on that a little bit, that idea. Yes, uh, I was attempting to, to speak about the the truth in the sense of complete truth. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I could do it in the book, but I think truth is, is an experience that transforms us uh, very deeply. Uh, I think it's a luminous experience. Uh, synchronicity is a way to reach this. Uh, sometimes we are very confused about something, we don't trust in our intuition, we don't trust in your senses. And something happened, uh, a synchronicity happened, and we, we stop and see, well, uh, I need to trust, that is true. Uh, in, during the sessions, uh, with the online sessions, is very interesting. The internet always gives trouble in the middle of some very complicated subject. Uh, the image throws, uh, I have a very, very good internet. And, and sometimes uh, the connection fails. Someone uh, forget to, to, to turn off the phone and an important call uh, came and the calling is totally connected with the subject we are speaking of and the people are avoiding uh, to go deep in that. It's very interesting, very, very interesting. And uh, it, it's something that uh, uh, is very touching when it happens because uh, it's not me saying something. It's like the whole in universe is sending a message in consonance uh, what is happening during the session. And uh, I think it's a uh, truth is, uh, it's, it's heavy to deal with truth because it means to, to give up our complex, uh, to give up our uh, persona, to give up our collective uh, belonging because truth sometimes is very solitary, so lonely. Uh, Gandhi says, uh, if, 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 if 
even if you are alone, uh, the truth is still the truth. Even if nobody believes on you, uh, when some truth is real, it's real. It doesn't matter if you are alone, if you, someone is believing in the same of you. Uh, absolute truth is the word I was looking for. I was discussing with James Maxwell. She was one of the persons I was speaking a lot uh, because Cassandra, uh, we are discussing, she, she's a teacher at the Jung Institute, but she is a physicist. And she, quantum physicist, she's a very interesting person. And uh, we are discussing if it exists or not, absolute truth. I believe it, it exists, but it's very difficult to reach because it's like insight. You have it and then it disappears and you have to come back to your entire process. You can't sit uh, over insight and be comfortable with, with that because insight, one insight, when you reach some truth, when you reach something very important that you can catch up, uh, at the, the next moment, uh, you don't have it anymore because when you have one truth, when you have a, a deep knowledge about something, uh, the, the, the questions about the rest of the world, they are all there waiting. Uh, every time you have a certainty, uh, you discover all the rest needs to be reevaluated. It, that's the, the, the way of psychotherapy. It's not a, a linear process. It's circumambulatory, like Jung says. Uh, you are always going in, in any direction, in some direction. It never stops, like individuation process. It's never endless. Uh, that's no, I don't believe in enlightenment. I don't believe in it. Uh, I, I think it's not possible. I think it's not human. Uh, it's uh, it's over us. You are so human, and uh, I, and I say something in the book also that God is jealous about humankind because I'm if sorry, he was. Did, what did you say you didn't believe in? What was that you didn't believe in? Was, was it? Said? Was it enlightenment that was the word? Enla used? Enlightenment, because we are human. You are not divine. Yes. You are. You are not. Uh, and uh, uh, when I think that, Just we, remind you to hold your mic up. Yeah, please. sorry. Um, because I, I, I think we build God's image. Uh, according to our expectations, because if you see God image in different cultures, in different epochs of humankind, uh, God is being transformed. Uh, in the beginning, it was she, then became he. And now we don't know anymore what is, it's transsexual or what kind of God we have. But... Uh, Every time, every history about God and God had, it's about uh, uh, He creates humankind. He's so bored with the perfection. Perfection is boring. We need them perfection. Uh, we need, uh, it, it's like the, the, the snapshot, uh, photoshopping the cameras you said, everybody looks so the same. We don't have individuality anymore. Uh, right. Perfection is boring. Uh, physics now is discovering the, the universe is not uh, symmetric, it's asymmetric. It's amazing. I was so happy when I, I saw it because life is not symmetric. Uh, it, it's confused. We don't need perfection. Perfection is boring. I, if you see people who, who find someone they find perfect, they don't stay with them. Yeah. I have the theory we fell in love by the defects, not for the qualities of the persons. I, I sometimes talk about um, 
the difference between logos and eros, and sometimes I talk about it as the difference between logos and life. But what I say about it, and I'd like to have your opinion about whether this makes sense, what I say is in, we need logos 100% because everything that we have in our rooms was built perfectly. When we bought it, we got it, and we liked it. We have it. We're looking at a screen right now. It had to be built perfectly and, and so on but everything that's that's in logos is dead it's not alive I, I sometimes say you know a bible is just a black doorstop unless you put life into it and and um and so the point the point is that everything that you can look around and see with the possible exception of potted plants or kitty cats or something like that everything is is built and it has to be perfect or you wouldn't have bought it whether it's a book or a sculpture or what have you it had to be perfect for you and yet none of it is alive and what we're missing is the fact that that we have to put life into things and and to live a life I, mean, I often put a picture up of a of a 64 foot motor yacht which the name of which is never enough uh, because you know the owner of that boat you know he probably had many other boats but you know did it make him happy he, uh, the boat the point is it's never enough and it's sitting at the dock empty nobody's using it it's not alive there's nothing alive about it it's only if he was using it that it would have life in it at all um, and so we've under undersold arrows to the point where we we almost don't have life anymore we we've and by that i mean um, we've built up all these structures even you know our rules the rule of law and all that sort of thing those are all logos, they're words, they're, it's a superstructure, but it doesn't connect us back, as you say, to really get, um, you know, the ability to reconnect. And, uh, anyway. and as we are seeing, as you know, many concepts in your affirmation, many things to think about, many. Are you speaking, Tim? Well, we were talking earlier about talking to the screen. You know, we've, we've entered this part in life where everybody's so attached to their phones, they don't really have this this face-to-face uh, -face contact. I worry about the younger generation. I have a niece who's, who's 17, and I wonder when she gets to be an adult, what will she think about relationships? Because all of all of the relationships she's had almost since she was a a school child have been through the phone and so how do we how do we create a society where where even the logos of a real live interchange with another human being is mediated by this machine well i think it's a uh... The problem is the virtual reality, it looks better than the reality itself. Uh, and uh, it's a trap because people look better in the screen than in real life. Uh, probably our homes look much better in the screen than uh, in our homes. Uh, we see, you watch a movie and you see the, the, the costumes. Uh, sometimes you see a costume in, in the internet. When you go to see the costume in, in person, it's nothing like that. Uh, uh, I end of mine, she was a... Uh, she was a... Uh, uh, she, she take dresses for uh, haute couture, um, and uh, she says, uh, "Paper accepts everything." In the screen, 
accepts everything. Real life don't. Uh, we have a generation of people that uh, are not prepared for frustration. That's the big problem we have about education. We have part of population that uh, has everything. They are not prepared to be frustrated. And even in lower classes, financially speaking, uh, they are giving to the children more than they're capable to, to, to do. Uh, people are not prepared for frustration. Frustration and boringness is part of life. That's why creativity starts. We need to be bored, we need to have time, and uh, we need to have uh, experiences to be creative. Uh, it is not just in the mind, we need sensation. And then uh, even uh, teenagers who have a very strong uh, life uh, through the phones, they are suffering a lot uh, with the pandemic now because they can stay at their rooms with TV and uh, games and so on, but they have the freedom to live and meet people in their life. Now they are feeling that that's not enough. Uh, I think this pandemic is a, is a big turning point uh, in evaluations about relationships, about values, about how much cars I have in my garage, uh, how many shoes I, I saw. One guy saying, I have 500 shoes, I have no place to go because I can't go out home. Uh, at first, who needs 500 pairs of shoes? Uh, but it's another point. Uh, we are grieving for something we don't know what is. Uh, maybe we have a chance to stop and think that we are grieving, uh, craving for connection, real connections. Uh, it, that's possible to have real connections even uh, by Zoom. I believe on it. But uh, we need the sensation, we need the smell, we need the, the sensorial experience uh, to, to touch uh, things, to, to smell things, to smell persons. Uh, every person has a different smell that unconsciously we feel. Uh, it's not about perfume, but uh, we feel it without realizing you are feeling. But sometimes, uh, if, you, if you don't like the smell of a person, it's not possible to have a relationship. Have you think about that? Uh, if you don't like the smell, uh, uh, people are connecting by Tinder and uh, apps for dating. Uh, they are very afraid to meet the person uh, in real life because uh, it's a proof that the connection can really happen or not. And sometimes it doesn't work at all. Uh, the description of the person, the figure, the appearance, everything is perfect, the conversation is perfect, but when they are together, it doesn't matter. We, we are human, uh, we need uh, sensation, we are not the screens, we are not, we are not computers. We can have a partial life through computer, but not the entire life. People are craving for human contact. Uh, people are very depressed now. Even the, the, the ones who live alone by option, they sometimes spend one month without going out, they're working at home, very inter interested in their own life, they are craving for human contact. And the uh, companies are doing uh, happy hours through Zoom and coffees uh, through Zoom. It, it feels part of the craving, but it's not enough. Some people are very, uh, they, they lost the interest because here, uh, if you are in a meeting uh, together, in person, many parallel conversations will happen and you will be very happy to have the parallels talking. Uh, that's what feeds uh, a party, that's what feeds a group. 
the informal conversation. Here, uh, one person needs to stop talking for the other one to be heard. Uh, if you are together, we don't need it. We are capable to hear many conversations. At least I am. I am specialized. My daughter says I am a Hadar. Uh, I can listen all the conversations around me, but, but, but is, uh, I don't need to, to try to do it. Uh, I can't avoid it. Sometimes I would like to avoid because the, the conversations around me are so awful. It's better to not be aware of that. But uh, uh, we have this capability to pay attention in many situations at the same time. And life in the screen uh, is taking it for us. Uh, we need another kind of concentration that is so tired. Uh, we, we, you are all so tired to be at spring all the time. Because we need to be fed by senses, by smells, by touches. Uh, I, I, I like coffee very much. I don't drink too much, but I like very much the coffee and the smell of coffee and house at, uh, at home. And then uh, I can't go out for a coffee. I like very much cafeterias, very much. Then when we started the pandemic, I bought a machine for me to make uh, the Italian, uh, how it calls, the espresso. To make a real espresso with the real coffee, not the Nespresso and Dolce Gusto, the real one. I am so frustrated because it's not the same pleasure. I, I like to go to the place, to see the attendants, to see the other people, to drink the coffee in a, in a, uh, a cup that I, I didn't have before, uh, feel the smell, and to eat something different that changes the taste of the coffee. It's not the same experience. Uh, I, I discovered that I don't like the coffee the way I, I, like, I, I think I like before. I like the experience uh, to the cafeterias that I enjoy very much. It's, it's, it's something we, we have to learn now. What we really like and what we don't we really care. So, Solange, we've uh, taken a lot of your time, and um, I certainly want to invite you to come back at any time. I'm going to add you to our uh, email list, especially for um, uh, one of the things that I have had the sense of is that maybe Jungian analysts don't even get to talk to one another very much. <laughs> and and uh, so um, I've been inviting other analysts uh, into the, to do a conversation like you're doing. And uh, when we do that, I'll make you aware of that so that you... Uh, Thank you, I appreciate that can uh, join us and join the conversation. Uh, not to pick your brains from a pro professional point of view, but to just interact and, and see the interaction. It's, um, it's often quite profound, and, and we've had a lot of uh, very profound sessions in this group. Um, is, is there any other burning question in the group, though, before we... Uh, I, yeah, I want to talk about the truth. You know, um, actually, I also the one who believe there's some ultimate truth, and everybody should tell the truth, make things much easier for everybody. That of like, sometimes we try, we think we think it's not telling the truth will. I I found actually people not telling the truth usually is not to protect others, it's protect themselves because they don't want to lose things. For example, people lie. They usually, they don't want to lose. If they tell the truth, they have to choose between two things. So they lie to keep both of them. That's my experience. But anyway, so I'm, but I, at one time, I was, I was writing this point about the truth, you know, people digging, digging, they're really scared. Why you have to see the truth? Then what you, what you dig out is a skull. It's very scary. So it's that my understanding truth sometimes too ugly to handle. That's why people would rather pretending something easier to handle. They don't want to face the truth. 
But it's interesting. I read another book by a Western philosophy. Actually, very shocking to me, because I have this vision like people, like the elephant, the blind people trying to the the truth is the elephant. And then we touch part of the elephant, trying to figure out what the truth is. But in that book, they actually mentioned they said were people the people doing a drawing of a person supposed to choose, then everybody draw very differently. But the shocking part is that when you see in the middle, there's nothing, which is like, it's, it totally blow my mind. It's like, because I would think there's the elephant or something people try to draw, which is the truth. Then people draw it differently. But this book, this philosopher, there's actually no truth. There's nothing. People just use their, their imagination. So they draw whatever they see from the truth which is very shocking, but it's very different perspective. So I always wonder, you know, like, is there really a truth? A truth? It's more like a religion in some way. You are, we are saying uh, uh, truth could be very personal. Everyone can have their own truth. Um, but I, I like very much one of Jung's quotes who says, uh, truth demands the concert of many voices. Uh, it's impossible to reach the truth uh, just for one point of view. You have to be open to many possibilities. And uh, every time you reach, you, you, you think you find the truth, you got some more information and you have to start over. Uh, it's almost uh, impossible to reach the absolute truth and and sometimes we can have this experience but it's a it's a moment it's a moment that you disappear soon uh, um, it's very complicated because we are living in a world that evaluates too much the personal truth. Even in psychoanalysis, people say, but is the client's inner truth? But if the inner truth is not uh, compatible with uh, the outer world, that's a problem. We have to be uh, in real life. We can't stay just in our minds and our inner truths and inner uh, um, self. We have to be connected with the world, with the persons around us. We are connected with the entire world by, by a virus now. Yeah. If it's not for good, it's for bad. Well, we've got to wrap it up here, but I just got to thank you for such a great session. Thank you. Like yeah. like Miles, I have a whole page of notes here, and and you're talking about the the different perspectives, and I feel like every time we hear from someone like you, we get a slightly different perspective on the reality that is our shared world. And so for me, that's, that's just priceless because it, it helps to orient me in my own place in the world, which is very, very different from yours. So thank you again, and I do hope you'll come thank back. Thank you. Yeah. I hope I can be one of the many voices of the concert. That would be great. Just one of them. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you very much. It's very yeah. pleasant to be with you. So, um, so we have a, a custom, and unfortunately, our Indian participant uh, was only got four hours sleep last night, so she didn't, uh, she wasn't able to come now. She actually was with me uh, for an hour and a half earlier today, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, um, she has uh, shared with us a uh, a Sanskrit mantra at the end, which is, uh, it's a prayer for the happiness of everyone in the world and a happiness for all of the world. And um, so, um, with apologies to Kushbu, I'd like to share it with you if you don't mind. Om Loka 
samasa sukino bhavantu loka samasa sukino Bhavantu Loka Samasa Sukino Bhavantu Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. If you're aware, I think I have the translation here. Uh, Shanti translates as eternal peace. Uh, Kushbu and I have been reading the Bhagavad Gita. It's a beautiful book for the last couple of week, weeks and, uh, and so I just happen to have it here and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank Solange. you so much, it yeah. was a pleasure. Yeah, take Bye. care, peace. Peace everybody, take care. <laughs>